A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Fall of the Oyo Empire. By the middle of the 18th century, the Oyo Empire stood at the peak of its territorial greatness, its prosperity and wealth, its pride and glory. Oyo armies stood on the banks of the Niger in the land of the Nupe, on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, on the river Moshi in the land of the Bariba, beyond the river Mano in the land of the Asia and Yu. Oyo's provincial officials, the Ayales, in their thousands held small courts throughout the expanse of these lands to represent the affairs and the majesty of their king and master, the Ilafin. The capital and heart of the empire, the city of Oyoila, boomed with a population larger than that of any other in the African tropical forests, with a volume of commerce far beyond that of any other city in the forest interior of West Africa, with the sound of songs and music, and of dance and theater, and scintillated with famous artists, artisans and entertainers, with great priests and medicine men, with wealthy traders and proud warrior chiefs. Many great cities, some only a little smaller than Oyoila itself, died of the Oyo kingdom, each a center of great wealth and power. The ruler of it all, the Ilafin, glowed and shimmered in glory, while at festivals women dancing in the adoring streets sang songs proclaiming him as Oriaye the head, or apex, of the world. Yet, by the end of the same century, this empire had gone a long way in disintegrating, and in the fourth decade of the 19th century it collapsed completely. The collapse was so total that by 1835 the great city of Oyoila was abandoned and left desolate. Today, only some stretches of its once mighty walls can still be seen, the city itself is covered by thick grass and shrub inhabited by wild beasts. Historians will long debate and search for the cause or causes of this strange, almost sudden, disaster. This chapter will attempt to tell what we know today of this sad story in the history of the Yoruba people. The beginning of the troubles, which ultimately led to this collapse, is traditionally traced to the late 18th century, the time of the Basaran Goha, circa 175,474. Gaha belonged to the lineage of the famous Basarun Yao Yamba, some traditions say that he was Yao Yamba's son. Before coming to the position of Basarun, Gaha had won brilliant honors as a warrior, and was extremely popular with the people of the capital city. He also had the reputation of commanding great ritual powers and potent charms. Only 17 days after he was sworn in as the Basarun in 1754, he embarked on a series of policies and actions aimed at suppressing the Ilafin and making himself, as Basarun, the absolute ruler of the Oyo Empire. To isolate the reigning Ilafin Labazi, Gaiha arrested and summarily executed prominent persons who were known to be Labais's friends and supporters. He then set up a reign of terror which intimidated and silenced all who would have opposed him. Replacing the Ayales in the provinces with his sons, relations and servants, he diverted tributes from the provinces to himself. The Ilafin Labazi became so intimidated that he could not even sit on the throne to perform the functions of a king. Rather than continue in such disgrace, Labazi did what Yoruba kings were supposed to do in dire extremities he removed himself with dignity by committing suicide. Gaiha then put on the throne a prince named Awan Bioju, who is said to have been a young friend of his. To Gaia's surprise, however, Awan Bioju as king refused to treat Gaha as a superior. Only 130 days after Awan Bioju came to the throne, therefore, Gaiha forced him to take his own life. The next Alafin, Ogbaluye, lasted longer on the throne. Humbly managing his relationship with Gaiha, he even celebrated a Bibi festival for three years and had vassal kings and chiefs come from all over the empire to honor him and Oyoila. But in the end, Ogbo Luye too came into a conflict with Gaiha and had to commit suicide. To succeed Ogbo Luye, Gaiha raised to the throne a prince named Majog. While appearing openly to submit to Gaiha, Majog recruited famous occult practitioners, Adahunts, to make powerful charms and formularies that would hurt or destroy the overmighty Basarun. When Gaha became paralyzed in both legs, the Ilafin believed that his charms were working and he and his team of Adahunts intensified their efforts. The paralysis, however, did not seem to have much effect on Gaia's hold on power. Finding ways to hide his paralyzed legs from the public, he continued to exercise despotic authority. According to the traditions, Gaha would have made himself king if such a thing were not impossible. In the end, However, Gaia's excessively crowded life began to take effect. The paralysis in his legs, which was almost certainly brought on by a stroke, proved to be the first major sign of a general deterioration of his health. He is said to have begun to look prematurely aged, and to have also started to lose his usual mental sharpness. More and more, his affairs fell into the hands of lesser men his sons, relations, cronies and servants, who generally used their influence for greed and for vicious oppression of vulnerable persons belonging to lineages and groups known to be opposed to Goha. 
many mindless acts of oppression committed by these people, including murders and seizures of defenseless citizens for sale into slavery, are preserved in the traditions. The result was that Goha began to lose popularity and as he did, his men's acts of oppression increased. Picking some petty quarrel with the Alafan Majog, Goha finally got rid of him. Then he installed on the throne a prince named Abyodun. Abyodun was a rich trader with trading connections and friends in the provinces of the empire. He was an intelligent and astute person. Though determined to get rid of Gaya's illegal authority, he knew that he could not win in an immediate confrontation with the old man, and that he had to employ all his astuteness and guile. He knew too that he could not depend on the mostly intimidated opponents of Goha in the capital city. He turned to the provinces for support, and gradually knit together a formidable plot led by all the greatest provincial war chieftains the Kakanfa Oyabayadajas, Opal the ruler of Igbagun, the Anakoyi, and others. While these schemes prospered, he bided his time and waited on, and flattered, Gaiha so much that even Goha himself became tired of it. While all these were happening, Gaiha grew visibly weaker in many respects. His popularity in the city continued to decline, his health continued to deteriorate, and the financial resources available to him shrank. His servants' oppressive conduct grew more and more sordid. As a result of their ineptitude and corruption, the amount of tributes reaching Goha fell off sharply, and most prominent people in the provinces became Gaia's enemies. More importantly, however, all the developments in the capital city began to have ominous effects in some of the tributary states. The first signs of trouble appeared in the northeast where the Nup became more and more audacious to raid in the Igbamana country. Under the Yetsu Jibrila in the 1760s, the Nup cavalry forces destroyed many Igbamana towns and villages. The rulers of the Oyo Empire were too preoccupied with their own power struggle in Oyo Ila to be able to do anything about the Nup raids. Jibrila's successor, the Yetsu Magii who started to rule in 1769, intensified the raids. At last, in 1774, Abyodun and his supporters were ready to strike. On the appointed date, the provincial war chiefs led their forces towards Oyoila. In the supreme command was the Kakonfa Oyobai, with the Ilafan Nabyodun by his side. When this huge army reached the gates of the capital city, the Oyoila chiefs who were opposed to Goha opened the city gates, and the Basarun's quarter came under a mighty siege. Goha himself, descendant of great warriors and hero of many battles, led the defense. In spite of his weakened health, he was still a very formidable commander. Gaia's forces therefore put up a ferocious defense. They were, however, greatly outnumbered by the invaders who were also commanded by some of the empire's most talented warriors. Slowly, the invaders pushed their way forward until they rolled over Gaia's quarter and came face to face with his compound. Around that compound, the fiercest fighting ensued the invaders losing countless men to sharpshooters hidden in the roofs. At last, the invaders burst into the compound, set it on fire, and took Gaha captive. Gaiha was brought to the palace and made to grovel in the dust before the victorious king, Abiodun, now seated in glory on the throne. For the rest of the day, Gaiha lay in the dust, while the crowds that had used to adulate him were allowed to come and taunt and humiliate him. The traditions have conflicting accounts of his end. One account has it that his body was burnt to ashes, another that his body was cut to pieces and the pieces were scattered all over the empire. But that was not the end of the fighting. After destroying Gaia's quarter and all its leading men, the victors went on to do the same to the compounds of the great warrior chiefs who were seen as rivals of the Ilafan. When this awful rampage was over, the Ilafan Abyodun ruled supreme over a city that was pockmarked with the smoldering ruins of great compounds from which the most valiant of men had gone out for two centuries to conquer and hold an empire for the Ilafan. Effectively, though not yet manifestly, the military glory of the kingdom of Oyoila was gone. The terminal manifestation of this truth would not come until about sixty years later, but when it came, there would be no strength to hold or save anything. Thus, Gaia's career as Basarun brought incalculable disaster upon the kingdom. Before we continue, then, we need to ask the question, why did Goha bend all his power and influence into such unrelenting hostility against the Ilafans? What were the roots of this disastrous disruption of the Oyoila monarchical system? A close look would seem to indicate quite strongly that the answer is to be found in the native character of the Yoruba monarchical system as it played out in its Oyoila version. Because the Oyoila kingdom became immensely successful as an empire builder, one tends to be led away from seeing its essential internal weaknesses. In fact, as the type of government established by the Yoruba people went, its Oyoila version was very unsuccessful in matters of inner cohesion and stability. Oyo traditions, recorded by Samuel Johnson for the two centuries of territorial expansion and imperial greatness, never failed to lay out, 
rain after rain, the symptoms of internal discordance and instability in the Oyo Ila monarchical government. Of the 17 kings who reigned from the end of the 16th century, when Abipa brought the government back to Oyo Ila after the exile, until the end of the 18th century, only four, Abipa, Abolo Kun, Ajagbo and Amuniwaiye, died natural deaths. Of the rest, not less than nine were forced to go to sleep, that is, commit suicide, one was poisoned, and one died in a palace fire caused by violent conflicts with his chiefs. For each of these contrived deaths, the traditions give two reasons first that the king ruled like a despot and second, that he exhibited some unacceptable moral weakness. Samuel Johnson lists the offenses as follows, unchecked despotism, unrestrained license, insatiable greed, and wanton voluptuousness. A look through the reins as listed reveals, however, that the charge of moral turpitude was true only in a few cases. In cases where no moral problem existed, kings were still forced to commit suicide. Of the 18th century Alafin Ojigi, for instance, the traditional record has it that he was personally a very good man, a warrior king who added much to the empire and ruled with dignity at home without question, one of the greatest men who ever ruled in Oyoila. Yet, his high chiefs, only because of some excesses committed by his Arimo, called on him to commit suicide. The third successor after Ojigi, the Alafin Nanashile, was a man of great talents. He was the great warrior prince of whom it was popularly said that his horse can leap over a town wall. Under him there was so much prosperity in the kingdom that, according to the Oyo traditions, the common musical instrument known as sikir, which is usually strung with hard nuts and seeds, was widely strung with cowrie shells and expensive beads with dyed silk threads replacing the usual cheap cotton threads. This king was also reputed to have considerable artistic gifts. He brought those gifts into the decoration of the palace, and commissioned silver doors for its innermost chambers. In spite of all his admirable qualities and contributions, for which he was very popular with the generality of his subjects, his high chiefs still contrived a pretext for asking him to go to sleep. In short, then, it seems obvious that the Yoruba monarchical system as it played out in Oyoila suffered an endemic disease. The system was, in its origins, built upon a plurality of lineages, and its inner strength and health inhered in checks and balances, and a healthy observance of such checks and balances by all groups. Oyo Ila does not seem to have ever succeeded in managing and upholding the checks and balances. And the root causes of that failure were the pressures exerted by Oyo Al's frontier location. An emphasis, or perhaps overemphasis, on military strength, imposed by the new Bariba frontier, while conferring enormous power on the Alafans' kingdom did violence to the checks and balances in its government by putting too much influence in the hands of the military leader lineages. The earliest Alafans, from the time of Sangho, were warrior kings who led their armies to war and who therefore arrogated to themselves powers normally considered by Yoruba people to be beyond royal prerogatives. The conflicts that could result from such a development would seem to have been part of Oyoil's experience from quite early in its history. In fact, it does seem very probable that the tradition about Sangho's failed experiment with lightning, resulting in a palace fire and his suicide, was a cover for a conflict at the palace, resulting in the burning down of parts of it leading the king, so rejected by his leading chiefs, to take his own life. It is instructive that, centuries later, a similar fire and suicide ended the reign of another Olaf in the Olaf and Karen in the 17th century. After the return of the government to Oyoila under the Olaf and Abipa, the Olafans no longer personally led their armies. That task fell to the great chiefs of the Oyo Masi, assisted by a large and varied cadre of military officers. This greatly elevated the top chiefs and sharpened the rivalry between them and the kings. In response, the kings built up an enormous palace establishment employing many hundreds of people, much larger than that of any other Yoruba palace, which sometimes behaved like an alternative government. Luxuriating at the very top of an empire which spread out from the Niger to the sea, the Alafans set up a glistening palace that resounded always with pomp and glory all to emphasize that they were the kings. In this palace setting, petty acts of excess occasionally occurred like the Alafan Naibi's order for the execution of the parents of one of his wives, in order to demonstrate the extent of his powers as Alafan to that wife, or the Alafan Amuniwaiye's adultery with his Babalawo's wife. But these acts of moral weakness were not the reason why the high chiefs rose up to demand their king's deaths, they were only the excuses and pretexts. An intense rivalry was going on between the monarch and the high chiefs, backed by their influential lineages. As the chiefs saw it, the kings were attempting to establish a royal autocracy, to stop it, they had again and again to exercise their power of forcing the king to go to sleep. Systematically resisting the Alafans, disputing and arguing with them or their servants, was out of the question. It was messy, and could damage the standing of the whole government before the citizens. 
and its potential for civil commotion was too high, especially if a popular Olafin was on the throne. Nobody would dare to strike, or even touch, the person of a king that was an unimaginable violation of powerful spiritual prohibitions and taboos. However, the way to stop an Olafin by summarily eliminating him was clearly set out in the traditional constitution, and it could be accomplished quietly in the deep recesses of the palace, out of the knowledge of the general citizenry. Oyo Ila chiefs resorted to this constitutional device more frequently than the chiefs of any other Yoruba kingdom because the Ilafans, being in possession of almost unlimited resources, attempted much more successfully than any other Yoruba monarch to tilt the balance of power in favor of the king, in violation of the checks and balances underpinning the unity of the plurality that constituted a Yoruba kingdom. At least two of the peculiar features which came into being along the way in Oyo Isle's political system are explicable in the context of the rivalry between the Ilafans and the High Chiefs. One was the creation of the position of Arona Kakonfo. The other was the provision that the Arima must die when his father died. The Ilafan Ajagbo's intention in the 17th century in creating the title of Arona Kakonfo, to which the Ilafan alone could appoint any citizen of his choice, was to establish a counterbalance to the growing influence of the great war chiefs of the Oyo Messi. It is significant that Ajagbo's first choice for the post of Arona Kakonfo was his personal friend, Kokoro Gongan, from outside Oyoila, in that case, the provision, made later by the government, that the Kakonfo must never live inside the capital city, was an act of damage control by the Oyo Messi. As for the mandatory death of the Arimo, it is clear from the traditions that the Ilafans had generally grown into the habit of associating their oldest sons with themselves and the functions of the throne as well as in the enjoyment of the pomp and circumstance of power. The Arimo's home became a sort of second palace, and some of the tributes from the provinces of the empire were designated as the Arimo's. The chiefs could not make the Ilafans change the trend, but they could establish a constitutional provision that effectively cut off the Arimo with his father. It is significant that the harsh constitutional provisions relating to the Arimo did not come into existence until the 17th century by which time the political and economic greatness of the Oyo Empire was beginning to have the effect, among other things, of placing at the Arimo's disposal enormous resources and influence. In a few other Yoruba kingdoms, such as in Adu and Ekiti, king's oldest sons were barred from being selected as kings, but there was no insistence on their dying with their fathers. Again, the difference arose from the fact that the Ilafans made their Arimos live like second kings. Some historians have suggested that the late 18th century troubles of the Oyo Kingdom were caused by the effects of the Atlantic slave trade. According to this line of reasoning, Oyo's increasing participation in the slave trade brought increasingly large amounts of wealth to the coffers of the Ilafans, and thus produced, in the late 18th century, the situation whereby the high chiefs became envious of the Ilafans and the palace officials a development which ultimately resulted in conflict and the disintegration of the kingdom. Other historians have, however, advanced strong objections to this suggestion. The most important of these is that, on the basis of available evidence, income from the slave trade was never so important a factor in the Ilafans revenue. According to Ade Ajayi and other historians, the revenue of the rulers of Oyo was not much related to the slave trade, but came mostly from taxes on trade in the marketplaces and the toll gates, from tributes and gifts rendered by the provincial rulers and the vassal rulers, from large-scale primary production on the king's farms and from trading ventures, in regular merchandise, in which the Ilafans employed many of their wives and servants. Though the revenue and assets accruing to the Ilafans from the operation of the slave trade were considerable and growing, they were quite a small part of the whole revenue and assets of the Oyo government. Besides, the slave trade never became so intense in Oyo and other Yoruba kingdoms in the 18th century as to command the capacity to disrupt the political system. While the participation of Oyo people in the slave trade did increase from the middle of the 18th century, the slave trade did not occasion, in the kingdom and its provinces, slave raids or similar disruptions, the types that were common in many other parts of tropical Africa, and the kingdom enjoyed orderly government in the protection of the roads conditions that were still largely intact even as late as the time of Clapperton's visit in the late 1820s. Idiagbo Akin Jogbin has offered the suggestion that the conflicts between the Ilafans and the high chiefs were a product of their divergent views, in the late 18th century, about the future of the Oyo Empire. According to him, while the Ilafans favored a cessation of expansionist wars and advocated a stable exploitation of the empire that had already been created, the great warrior chiefs favored further and further expansion. Almost all the Ilafans of the 18th century were traders before coming to the throne, princes who had traded to various parts of the empire, others leaned heavily on influential supporters who were rich traders. The high chiefs, on the other hand, were sons and descendants of warrior chiefs, men who were raised for military leadership. 
because the two sides did not find some way to reconcile their opposing views, so goes this line of reasoning, the prolonged crises of the Basarungaya's time, in the last half of the 18th century, resulted. The basic details of this line of reasoning seem to be borne out by some of the available information. The Alafans and the great war chiefs, conditioned by their divergent backgrounds and worldviews, appear to have wanted for the empire different types of future. However, this was only a late 18th century development at the time when the empire had already been built to its farthest reaches. The constitutional conflicts in the government, on the other hand, had been ongoing almost from the inception of the kingdom. The sharp differences generated by the realities of the late 18th century only served to provide a new battleground for the age-old conflicts between the Alafans and their topmost chiefs. The inability to reach a compromise in the late 18th century was conditioned by the endemic hostilities in the government. The Basarangaha did not merely try to impose his view on the running of the empire, the more important thrust of his doings was to readjust the balance of power decisively against the Alafans. In the process, he went into unimaginable excesses and thus enabled a very intelligent Alafan to strike back and strike back devastatingly not only against Goha but against all the powerful warrior chiefly lineages. The Alafan Abiodun's success readjusted the balance of power sharply in favor of the kings, but it did so at a price that the kingdom could not afford to pay without critically losing military strength. By destroying the top levels of the warrior lineages, Abiodun destroyed the foundations of Oyo's military power. Meanwhile, Abiodun went on to rule in great pomp and glory, until about 1789. His reign is popular in Oyo traditions as a very prosperous one. Trade in particular prospered greatly. Oyo traders went far in all directions, not only in the Oyo Empire or the rest of Yorubland, but into countries far beyond those territories. Many created considerable fortunes for themselves. The Alafan Abiodun's personal popularity in the provinces kept the empire more or less intact. By nature a very pleasant and diplomatic person, he kept the friendship of the provincial kings and chiefs and the loyalty of the vassal kings and chiefs. There were, however, obvious negatives in the Abiodun regime, but they were either not seen as serious or not even seen as problems at all. The Nuuk continued to raid the Igbomina country while the Alafans government lauded itself on the peace and prosperity in the empire. The participation of Oyo people and traders and, therefore, of Yoruba land in the slave trade increased greatly and was to continue to do so until the end of the century and into the 19th century. The pattern, as far as can be ascertained from Yoruba traditions, is that Oyo people were the suppliers of most captives, while Oyo, Ijebu, Ou, Igba, Awari and Igbato traders received the captives and took them for sale to European slave traders at the ports. Probably as many slaves as were exported were kept in Yoruba land as domestic slaves, employed in domestic services, trade and farming. As pointed out in the previous chapter, Oyo traders bought large numbers of Noob, Hausa, and Bariba in Asia slaves for export as well as for sale into domestic service. Judging from the large crowds of Hausa, Asia and Fulani slaves who were freed or who fled to Aloran from all over the Oyo country from about 1817, the total number of non-Yoruba persons in the Oyo slave trade appears to have been very considerable. Still, the available evidence suggests that the number of Yoruba, especially Oyo, Persons who ended up as slaves increased steadily from the last decades of the 18th century. Also, more and more ambitious and capable Oyo men and women ventured into the slave trading enterprise. Kidnapping and other nefarious activities, and the fear of them, grew and so did insecurity for the poorer, weaker and more vulnerable members of society. For instance, an Oyo Ila prince named Awol, who was then a trader, employed a close friend of his to help attend to his porters on a trade trip to Apamu in the Ife Kingdom. At Apamu, he secretly went to slave traders and offered to sell his friend as a slave to them. The price was agreed, a wool received payment, and the traders went and grabbed the unsuspecting friend, and bound him for the journey through Ijebu to Lagos. Fortunately, Apamas law enforcement officers came on the scene and released the poor man and arrested his perfidious friend and prince. Such a story describes symptoms of a societal disease that was growing. But under the Alafin Nabiotun, the overwhelming sentiment among the rich and influential was gratitude to the Alafin for peace and prosperity in the empire. The glory of Abiodun's reign was a facade, but the facade dazzled so brilliantly that Abiodun's subjects could not see what was happening to their kingdom and empire. The titles of Basarun and others continued to exist, and men continued to be appointed to them from the shells of the same old lineages, but none of these chiefs now commanded the support of a great proud lineage or the power and confidence of his predecessors. For the first time in Oyo Al's history, the Alafan could act at will and rule without needing to wait for, or lean upon, a powerful Oyo Masi that commanded the devotion of the masses. The old constitution was dead. 
a new one unknown to Oyo history had taken its place one featuring almost unrestrained royal despotism. A royal administration free of troubles constituted by the great chiefs might be attractive to the Alafan's friends and supporters, but it stood on feet of clay. A lovable and skillful Alafan like Abiodun at the top of it might appear to keep the structure of government, kingdom and empire intact and strong, but as soon as lesser men occupied the throne, the façade would come crashing down. In times before Gaius and Abiodun's, if an Alafan were insufferable or incompetent, the kings and chieftains of the Oyo country would still have great Basaruns, Agbaakins and others like them in the heart of the imperial government to embrace. After the suppression of the power, prestige and influence of the great central chiefs, an insufferable or incompetent Alafan commanded enormous capacity to take the whole system to its grave. The most potent cause of the failure of a state is the disloyalty of its politically influential citizens and functionaries to its constitution and traditions. The era of Goha and Abiodun produced such influential disloyalties to the fundamental principles and traditions of the Oyoila kingdom. When Goha dedicated his talents, power and influence to the toppling of the Alafan from his exalted place at the top of the system, he initiated a process of demolition and destruction. When the Abiodun reaction suppressed the power, prestige and influence of the great lineages and great chiefs, it completed the process. The core pillars of the strength of the Alafanate were devastated by Gaha and Abiodun. After that, the great state of the Alafans only limped painfully, inexorably, towards its demise. The superficially glorious reign of Abiodun was, therefore, no more than a transition. The consolidated kingdom of the Oyo people that was the great pillar upon which the empire stood must have very respectable leadership from the Oyo Ila center to sustain its integrity and strength, and it fed on the glory and euphoria of successes and victories. When the Oyo Ila center fell manifestly sick after Abiodun and the succession of victories and parades stalled, the consolidated kingdom became quickly unglued and the empire that it upheld disintegrated. No Oyo army won any significant victory after the Goha Abiodun era till the very bitter end in the 1830s. Under Gaha, an Oyo army defeated an Ashanti army in the far west in 1864 and that may have been an attempt to keep expanding the empire's boundaries, but nothing was ever heard again of action in this border area, and Gaya's great enemies and preoccupation were the Alafans and their known supporters at home. Under Abiodun, the Oyo army invaded the Bariba country in 1783 in order to suppress a rebellion against Oyo rule. The Oyo army was heavily defeated and lost many of its leading commanders. Except for that unsuccessful war, and a victory over the Mahi in 1788, Abiodun put the Oyo military almost completely to sleep. When, for instance, there were signs of disobedience and unrest in some coastal dependencies of the Oyo Empire in 178,286, Abiodun asked his loyal vassal, K.P. Ingla, the king of Dahomey, to go and suppress the revolt for him because those places were too far for his own army to go to. It was in this period that Oyo's superiority in cavalry was allowed to slip away a development with terrible consequences later on. When later Alafans tried to wake up the army, the edge was already too far lost. As will be seen later, some of the last Alafans of Oyoila, especially the very last three, Majatu, Amato and Ayuiwu, though no great warrior princes, were certainly men of some competence and considerable dedication to the kingdom's greatness, their great weakness was that they did not have the sharp military tools that their warrior predecessors had had. It might be suggested that by the time of Goha and Abiodun, the empire had reached optimum expansion and that a powerful military, therefore, was no longer needed for expansionist wars. But it cannot be suggested that, at any time, a strong military was not needed for holding the empire. It certainly was needed. That was the nature of the empire that the Alafans and their people had created. When the Oyo kingdom slipped into losing its military superiority, it risked losing everything. Abiodun died in about 1789 and was succeeded by his cousin Awol the same prince and traitor whom we have earlier met at Apamu. Tall and handsome, Awol did not, unfortunately, possess the qualities of character that had enabled Abiodun to keep the kingdom and most of the empire in apparent unity, happiness and prosperity. He was a distrustful, vindictive and scheming ruler. As a result, Oyo traditions have mostly saddled him with the responsibility for the collapse of the kingdom and empire. According to the traditions, his meanness and vindictiveness pushed him into contravening a very important ancient prohibition, he ordered an attack on a town in the Ife kingdom. The account is that when Awol had been arrested for illegally selling his friend at Apamu, he had been brought before the bail of Apamu, and the bail and his chiefs had tried him, found him guilty and ordered him punished. When Awol became Alafin, therefore, one of the first things he wanted to do was to punish the bail of Apamu in retaliation, so he ordered the Oyo army to attack and sack Apamu. 
Shocked by the Alafin's orders, the commanders of the army hesitated and agonized at a place called Bji. While they did so, the Bale of Apama fled for refuge to the palace of the Uni of Ife. His flight to the Una's palace suddenly threatened to provoke a culturally unacceptable situation a war by the Uni against a Yoruba kingdom. While the Uni and the Ife chiefs mulled over this, the Bale of Apamu himself came to the decision that, rather than cause such a culturally unthinkable conflict, he would give his own life to save his town. Returning to Apamu, he directed his chiefs to take his head to Oyoila to appease the Alafin and he committed suicide. Though an actual attack on Apamu was thus averted, a wall has nevertheless passed into Yoruba traditions as the first Yoruba king ever to raise hands against the Ife kingdom. How much importance the historian should attach to that is debatable. In some Yoruba traditional elite circles, there exists some residual belief that a wall's invasion of the Ife kingdom initiated his own destruction as Alafin and the destruction of the traditional and spiritual foundations of peace in Oyo and all of Yoruba land. However, at a less spiritual, more earthly level, Awol also went on to do many things to destroy his own authority as Alafin. Even while the Ipamu affair was still in progress, the traditional account noted that the Alafin Awol's character was generating problems between him and many chiefs. The first was Afonja, the new Aronakak Onfa who lived in Alarn, some 40 miles southeast of Oyoila. Awol himself had just appointed Afonja as Kakonfo, but deeply distrusted him because Afonja, who was related to the royal family through his mother, had aspired to be a Lofin at the time that the chiefs had selected a wool. His hostility towards Afonja was commonly known among the other chiefs. At the same time, his inept handling of a number of small issues, and his penchant for cursing and for invoking the anger of the gods and ancestors in little matters, created enmity between him and many other chiefs including the Basaran and the Ooda, one of the Essos. News of palace intrigues against Afonja reached him easily, and the Onikoyi, who was close to Afonja, also became offended. Thus, both at home in Oyoil and in the rest of the Oyo homeland, Awol raised up enemies against himself. In this atmosphere, Awol ordered a military campaign against the Noop in 1790 or 1791. For about 30 years, the Noop had raided the Igbamana country, without the Oyoil government doing anything about it. A Dahomey tradition, echoed by a contemporary report by a European on the coast, claims that, in fact, the Noop had, by 1791, reached the point of actually demanding or extracting tributes from Oyoila as payment for not invading the Oyo country itself. This is not corroborated by either Oyo or Noop traditions and is, almost certainly, an exaggeration a swipe by Dahomey against its Oyo overlord. Whatever might have been his reason, Awol did order the army out against the Noop. The army marched out, and returned defeated. Suzerainty over the Bariba had been lost in 1783, now in 1791 Oyo also lost its suzerainty over the Noop province by province, the empire was melting down. The return of the defeated army could only have added more to the gathering gloom around the Alafin. The storm finally burst when Awol ordered the army, led by the Kakonfo, the Anakoyi and the Bale of Igbagun, to attack the town of Iwere, against which he apparently had some complaint. The royal servants who accompanied the army had been instructed not to disclose its real destination to the Kakonfo until it had reached the vicinity of Iwere. When the army stood outside Iwere and the royal servants told the Kakonfo that his orders were to sack Iwere, the Kakonfo and the other commanders immediately refused to carry out the king's orders. They suspected, correctly, that the king's objective was to destroy the Kakonfo and not Iwere. Iwere was reputed to be one of the best naturally fortified towns in the country, protected by steep rocky hills and approachable only by steep narrow paths. An inadequately prepared attack on Iwere had a good chance of failing and failure would mean that the Kakonfo must take his own life. Moreover, the Kakonfo and the other war chiefs could not see what the Alafin had against this town probably nothing more than his characteristic animosities from the past, and they were not eager to give their services to such. Even more importantly, Iwere did deserve to be respected, it was the hometown of the mother of the late and beloved Alafin Abiotun and the lineage compound where she had grown up as a girl was a place of attraction to travelers and traders on their way through the town. The army went into a full mutiny, led by its commanders. The royal servants were gathered together and slaughtered. Then the army headed back towards Oyoila. Outside the capital city, they stopped and camped, unsure what to do next. When the Alafin invited the commanders to come and see him, they refused to go to him. At last, they came to a decision, the king must go. An empty calabash was respectfully sent to the king. He knew what it meant and he complied, after, according to the traditions, invoking the anger of the gods and ancestors and pronouncing his last terrible curses on his chiefs and kingdom. He had reigned for seven years, 
178,996. When the news of the king's death was received, the army entered the city in triumph, and some of the men did some looting, thus symbolically conquering the city, before their commanders ordered them to disperse to their homes. The spirit of rebellion against the Ilafin, and of disrespect for the city of Oyoila, that had been thus engendered did not, however, disperse. Both in the capital city and in the provinces, discontent, even disgust, with the Ilafin's government grew. During the few months of interregnum after Iwol, the Basarana Shamu, chief Bada of Saki, acted as regent the first person from the provinces to be thus appointed as the Basarun. During this regency, the Igba provinces rose in a massive revolt against Toyo's overlordship. The Igba people had always been unhappy about the less responsible ones among the Oyoyalis, some of whom were greedy and rapacious and behaved as superiors of the Igba kings. In the course of the late 18th century, almost certainly during Gaia's time, the greed and exactions of such Ayalis appear to have become excessive. Taking advantage of the interregnum in Oyoila, with a provincial chief acting as regent, one Igba chief named Lizabai began to organize the Igba people for an overthrow of Oyo rule. Lizabai belonged to the Igba Lake province, he was born at Itaku and lived at Igbine. Reputed to be very tall and broad, Lizabai was a wonderful organizer and leader of men. Lizabai started his organizing by taking advantage of the traditional system of Aro combination of local farmers for helping one another on their farms. Working secretly, he linked the small local groupings together throughout the Igba country to form one secret organization. Then he changed the objective of the organization and turned it into a sprawling underground army, with the new name of Igba Orogun. When all was ready, Lizabai gave the signal for a general uprising by killing the Ajel at Igbine, sometime around 1797. Within days, about 600 Ayalis were killed in all ports of Igbaland. The Ilafans government set up a large army made up of contingents from Oyo, Igbato, and Iberapa. Since Oyo Ila could no longer command the services of leading war chiefs like the Kakanfo of Fonja or the Bale of Igbagan, the army that proceeded to Igbaland was officered by men with smaller names. This army crossed the Ogun River and headed for Igbine, Lizabeth's hometown. Lizabai formed the men of Igbine and surrounding towns into an army and, as its commander, showed how good a general he was. He ordered the people of Igbine to desert their town, and he then hid his army in ravines where the Oyo army could not see them. The Oyo army easily entered the town, but as they searched round in it, Lizabeth's hidden men descended upon them. The Oyo army was completely routed. Lizabai had won independence for the Igba people and the Oyo empire had lost its Igba provinces. As for Lizabai, he continued for a long time, according to Biobricus' account of his life, to bring varied benefits into the life of his Igba people. He gave his people laws. He taught them to aspire to trade far and wide, including taking their kalanuts to the countries beyond the Niger, so that they might become rich and, as he put it, wear the best types of clothes. He taught them to defend themselves. Lizabai seems to have lost much of his popularity in his last years, and the reason for that is not clear. According to Biobaku, his insistence on recruiting men into military service probably conflicted with the labor needs of families on the farms. Some traditions have it that he died in a forest, probably during a Dahomey invasion, others suggest that he was killed by some other Igba chiefs who were jealous of his influence. In the dust and despondency caused by the military disaster at Igbine and the loss of the Igba country, a prince named Adabo succeeded Awol as Alafin. Adabo found himself to be a king in name only, unable to command the loyalty of his chiefs and subjects. Loss of respect and affection for the Alafin in the capital city of Oyoila, already growing during Awol's reign, increased dramatically. The Alafin, the palace, and the capital city had used to be objects of pride and adoration in all parts of the Oyo country. By Adabo's time they had become objects of some embarrassment, generally derided in crude sayings and songs. Many songs contrasted the reigns of Abio Dun's successors with what was regarded as Abio Dun's glorious reign. One song, for instance, claimed, In Abio Dun's time we scooped money, cowries, with the calabash, in Awol's time we packed our belongings, ready to flee. It became quite common for kings in the Oyo homeland to distance themselves from the Alafin and from the affairs of Oyo Ila in order to retain the loyalty and admiration of their own subjects. To be a citizen of the capital city of Oyo Ila had used to be a matter of great pride in all parts of the Oyo homeland, by Adabo's time it had become something to be almost ashamed of. The Alafin Zalaris previously walked the earth with great authority in all Oyo towns and villages, by Adabo's time, they dared not even show their faces in some Oyo towns and villages. A falling away of prominent Oyo rulers and chieftains seemed more imminent by the day. At last, towards the end of Adabo's short reign, it came. Opal, Bale of Igbagun, 
was the first prominent chieftain to announce his independence. Some lesser chiefs soon followed suit. In short, even the central homeland of the Oyo Empire had begun to break into fragments. The Alafan Adaba reigned for only months and was succeeded by Maku, who also reigned for only a few months. When Maku died in about 1799, his reign was followed by a long interregnum, which lasted until about 1802. He was then succeeded by Majatu, whose reign lasted until 1831. All these kings reigned over an empire that had shrunk to only a small rump of its former self, and a kingdom that was breaking up. During Majotis reign, in 1823, Dahomey asserted its independence. During these reigns and interregnums, each of those Oyo chieftains who had declared themselves independent of Oyo Ila struck out to carve a separate kingdom for himself in the Oyo homeland. The first to take action was Opal, the Bale of Igbagun. Opal set up his own army, and with it he took Igbo Ou and Adafian, but he died fighting while attempting to take Igboho. Probably during the long interregnum between Maku and Majatu, the Kakunfo of Fonja Adaloran declared his independence. Because of Fonja, from this point on, became the most important person in the final disintegration of the Oyo Empire, it is necessary to give some details about him. Afonja's father was Alagbin, Bale of Aloran. Alagbin's grandfather, Ladrin, was the founder and first Bale of Aloran, succeeded by his son Fasan. Fasan II was succeeded by his son Alagbin, and Alagbin by his son Afonja. The Ladrin royal family of Aloran enjoyed considerable fame in the Oyo country for its valor and leadership qualities. Afonja's mother was a member of the Alafan royal family of Oyoila. After the death of the Alafan Nabyotun, Afonja, Bale of Aloran, but related to the Oyoila throne through his mother, surfaced as one of the princes being considered by the Oyo Masi for selection as Alafan. He is said to have had many friends and admirers in influential circles in Oyoila. However, it was Awol that was selected. Soon after Awol became the Alafan, he invited Afonja to Oyoila and conferred on him the title of Arona Kakanfo. Awol was very suspicious of Afonja, because of Afonja's popularity in Oyoila. His appointment of Afonja as Kakonfo, therefore, was not out of love, but a stratagem for keeping Afonja out of Oyoife. But since Afonja's popularity only continued to rise, Awol finally tried to destroy him. The result was the Iwari campaign, the revolt of the army, and the death of Awol. After Awol's death, Afonja's name surfaced again very prominently among the princes being considered by the Oyo Masi. But by then, Afonja had become the type of powerful, rich or influential prince that Yoruba kingmakers usually would not select as king. So, Afonja was passed over and Adabo was selected. After Adabo's short reign, Afonja was again rejected and Maku, said to be a close friend of Afonja, was chosen. Very probably, the Oyomasi reckoned that the selection of Afonja's friend would pacify Afonja. If so, they were wrong. When Afonja received the traditional message that a new moon has risen at Oyoila, he snapped back, and let that moon set quickly. Like Adabos, Makas reign too was very short. After a poorly planned campaign led by him to suppress Igbo Gun's independence failed, his dispirited chiefs asked him to save face by going to sleep. While the long interregnum following Makas death dragged on, Afonja finally came to the conclusion that he would never get selected as a Lafin, and he began to think of other ways to achieve his ambition. A close look at his activities indicates quite clearly that what he desired was a realignment of power in the Oyo country that would replace the Ilafans dynasty with his own dynasty, which would then revamp and re-establish the greatness and glory of the Oyo Empire. This would require, most of all, a great military establishment with which to unify all of the Oyo homeland under his own leadership. As for the Ilafans, they would be allowed to hold the city of Oyoila as a one-city kingdom inset in the new consolidated Oyo kingdom ruled by Afonja. With the united energy of all Oyo people, the authority of the empire would be re-established on all its former provinces and more territories would be conquered. The capital city of the new empire would be Aloran. The condition of things in the Oyo homeland seemed to favor all these plans. The prestige of the Alafin and of Oyoila had fallen terribly in most places, and so had the Alafin's authority almost everywhere. But there was also universal nostalgia about, and yearning for, the former greatness of the empire. People sang songs praying that the Alafan Abiodun's times would come back. In spite of the loss of almost all non Oyo provinces, what remained of the empire was still quite large and potentially mighty. The rich Igbato province was still strongly loyal to the empire. In spite of the weakening of imperial authority and the ravages of the slave trade, the fabric of law and order still held so that even as late as the late 1820s, a foreign visitor could still describe the Alafan's domains as a fine kingdom. Even as things stood, 
a vigorous and talented ruler could still re-solidify the Oyo base of the empire, bring back the enthusiasm and glory of military victories, and turn the tide. Looking all around him, Afonja must have felt that he was specially created for such times and such accomplishments. After the death of Opal, Bale of Igbogun, no leading person in the Oyo homeland stood nearly as high as the Bale of Aloran and Krakonfo of the Oyo Empire. First, then, Afonja renounced his loyalty to the Alafin and asserted his independence. Secondly, he began to work on raising Iloran from a small town to a town big enough to be capital of the kingdom and empire of his thoughts. There were many small villages in the vicinity of Iloran Kanla, Ganmo, Idafian, Elahinjare, Okoyi, Igben, Eresa, Iber and others. One by one, Afonja persuaded the inhabitants of these villages to relocate to Iloran. He had a friend named Solig Baru who lived in the large town of Kuo and who had become a very rich and influential person there. Afonja persuaded him to relocate to Aloran, bringing his large family, relatives, friends and followers with him. Salik Baru came and settled a large quarter which he named Oksuna Quarter of the Faithful once because he was a Muslim convert. Using Salik Baru's Islamic connections, Afonja also persuaded a well-known Fulani Muslim preacher named Sali, called Alimi by the Yoruba, to come and reside in Aloran. Alimi had come on visits to Aloran and many other Oyo towns before, preaching Islam and selling charms. Alimi came and invited his sons down from Sokoto. The coming of Alimi was especially important to Afonja's plans, Afonja needed Alimi to make charms for him for the wars he was about to embark upon. Within a few years, Aloran had become quite a large city and continued to grow. Thirdly, Afonja embarked on building up his war machine. As foundation, the chieftains who had constituted the pillars of his command as Kakonfo stayed by him. Of these, the most important were Toj, the Bale of Ogbomoso, who commanded Afonja's right wing, and Fagbohun, Bale of Jubata, who commanded his left wing. The system, as it had traditionally operated, was that each of these commanders raised and trained in his own home area the troops that he would bring into battle under the Kakonfo's supreme command. Over and above them, moreover, the Kakonfo himself could issue calls to men in all parts of the country. Probably in about 1801, Afonja was suddenly confronted by a major crisis. Oho Agin Bambaru one of Gaia's sons who had escaped as a youth to the Bariba country at the time of the massacre of Gaia's people, returned to the country at the head of a large army which he had recruited in the Bariba country. Claiming to be fighting for the Alafin and the kingdom, Oho Agin Bambaru went after Afonja and, as his army moved through the country, some sympathizers joined it. Afonja marched his own army out to meet Agin Bambaru, but he was defeated in three successive battles and had to fall back on Aloran. Agin Bambaru then besieged Aloran. Again and again it looked as if Aloran would fall, but Afonja managed to hold on until Agun Bambara's army was worn down. Then in a main engagement, Afonja won a victory outside the walls, thereby forcing Agun Bambaru, though his army was still mainly intact, to withdraw from Aloran and return to the Bariba country. With this victory over Agun Bambaru, Afonja's fame increased enormously. Before the coming of Agun Bambaru, he had had no rival in the country. After the victory, he became the undisputed military lord of the whole of the Oyo homeland. From all over the Oyo homeland, young men went to offer their services to him either directly under him or under the chiefs belonging to his command. Then, in about 1817, Afonja took an action that must rank as one of the most momentous in Yoruba history. He offered freedom and protection to Muslims and slaves who would flee to him in Iloran. To understand this action, a brief background is necessary. Islam had long established some presence among the Yoruba people, but until the beginning of the 19th century it had never caused any tension or encountered any intolerance except briefly under the Alaf and Awol. But thanks to the influence of a radical Islamic movement which emerged in Hausaland in about 1804, Islam in Yoruba land became radical and aggressive, therefore provoking violent reaction in many towns in the Oyo country. A full account of this situation belongs to a later chapter. Suffice it to say here that many Muslims were killed or forced to flee from their homes, some of them coming to live around Salik Baru and Alimi in Aloran, the city whose ruler, Afonja, had declared himself independent of the Alafin's kingdom. As these Muslim refugees came, the men among them, sizzling with anger against the Alafin and the Oyo rulers who had persecuted them, were very zealous to join Afonja's army and fight for him against the Alafin's establishment and against the communities from which they had fled. Even though Afonja's political plans and wars had nothing to do with their Islamic faith, and even though Afonja himself showed no desire to convert to Islam. From this circumstance, Afonja came to the idea that he could easily and quickly build up a large army by tapping into the fears and anger of Muslims in the Oyo homeland. Moreover, 
there were very many slaves of foreign origin, mostly Hausa, but also Noop, Bariba, Asia and Fulani, in Oyo homes all over the kingdom, kept as cowherds, farmhands, stable tenders, rope makers, barbers, etc. Most of the Hausa among these were known to be Muslims. Afonja decided that offering these slaves their freedom and protection in Aloran could yield a big addition to the army that he could amass from the Yoruba Islamic community. Afonja obviously had no understanding of the religious implications and possibilities of his idea. His was just a talented military mind seizing upon a ready opportunity to create a massive war machine. Afonja made his proclamation in 1817, and provoked an immediate surge of Muslim migration to Aloran from all over the Oyo homeland. Most of the refugees were Oyo people but a large number consisted of slaves of foreign origin, Hausa, Noop, Bariba, Asia and others, fleeing from their owners. Since the Hausa were the majority among these, Oyo traditions tended to refer to them all as Hausa. Training and arming these men as they came, Afonja achieved his ambition of amassing a very large army. As the refugees flocked to Aluran, they swelled Afonja's army. Beyond that, however, a bond of unity developed among them especially among the mass of former slaves partly because of the latter's ethnic affinities, partly because most were Muslims, partly because they were one mass of poor, common people. They became known, and called themselves, Jama, an Arabic word meaning community of Muslim folks. They created symbols of identity for members of their group large metal rings which they wore on thumbs and fingers and with which they greeted one another, by touching ring to ring. Needless to say, the Jama Brotherhood did not involve a Fonja at all and it is obvious from all available evidence that he never sought to be involved. In effect, two parallel structures emerged in Elor and Afonja's army and the Jama Brotherhood. Judging from the subsequent behavior of the Jama, the mood in the Brotherhood was partly one of gratitude to Afonja, partly of intense anger of the Oyo refugees towards the traditional political establishment of the Oyo country, and partly of vengefulness among the ex-slaves towards the masters from whom they had fled. Moreover, the highly placed among the Yoruba Muslim refugees tended to stick to Salagburu for their religious observances, while the larger group of common people of the Jama of all cultures coalesced around Alimi. Thus, signs of trouble were not slow to appear. But these were only the beginnings. In its ultimate outcome, Afonja's proclamation of freedom and protection for Muslim refugees was to turn out to be a great disaster. In the mass of the ex-slave foreign-born Jama, he had set up an army of men who had no stake or interest in his political doings and who had good reason to use their newfound powers in his military establishment to hit back at their former slave owners and at the country of their former enslavement. As he would soon discover, he had created a monster that would devour him and devastate his country. For the time being, the immediate effect of the refugees and the Jama was to enhance Afonja's striking capability. Having no reason to fear any serious opposition, he embarked on bringing the whole of the Oyo country under his own authority. His strategy seems to have been to start by subduing the farthest provinces, and then move from there to the more central ones. That way, by the time he came close to Oyoila, any force that the Ilafin could raise to oppose him would be small. He overran parts of Big Bamana, and from there descended on the Ibolo province, taking such heavily populated towns as Eresa, Ajigbo, Ilabu and others. In the Epo, Asin, province, some young chiefs formed a military band, in imitation of Afonja aimed at carving out an area of authority for themselves. Their band, named Ogowar, began to attract considerable attention. Afonja hurried south to the Epo province, took most of the towns there and stamped out the Ogowar. Afonja's military campaigns were all easy successes. There was no town, warrior or group strong enough to resist him in the country. Even the Olaf and Majata watched helplessly as Afonja and his large army took town after town. But in the end, it all turned out to be futile or even worse than futile. Afonja never completed the territorial conquests of his desire. He was stopped in his tracks by forces of his own creation. The Hausa and other foreign-born members of the Jama, whose numbers kept increasing as more and more slaves fled from their masters, became a curse, first on the country and then on Afonja himself. In every town against which Afonja commanded them, they made a point of going into horde excesses of ravaging, looting and destroying. Even worse, they developed the practice of going off on their own, usually in small bands to attack towns and villages, their objective being to loot, and extort valuables from defenseless householders and thus carry away loads of brazenly stolen goods. One such band would enter a town or village, billet themselves on the compound of a well-to-do citizen, eat and drink to excess, snatch and extort things from the residents of the compound, and then use the compound as a base for attacks on other compounds. They particularly enjoyed returning to the homes where they had been slaves before, 
in order to humiliate their former masters and take away valuables. Since these brigands were generally regarded as Afanja's servants, nobody usually dared to raise a finger against them, for fear of offending and provoking Afanja. In towns and villages across the Oyo country, people therefore began to pack their belongings and leave all of them heading southwards, beyond the Asan River, into the territories of the Ijesha, Ife, Ou, and Igba. These migrations marked the beginning of a new era in Yoruba history. As for Afonja himself, it took him long before he saw that the Jama, especially the foreign-born group in the Jama, were a danger to the country and to himself. Blinded by the euphoria from his military victories, he became conceited and arrogant, absolutely sure that nothing could hurt him. Many people in his immediate circle warned him about the Jama's behavior and its probable repercussions on himself, but he was too self-assured to listen. Those who persisted in warning him became his enemies. In fact, one of such men, Fag Bohun, chief of Jabuda, a close relation of Afonja and commander of the left wing of his forces, in the end had to keep a distance from Afonja for fear that he would kill him. By the time Afonja became wise to what was happening, the Jama had grown beyond control. He threatened again and again that he would disband them or wipe them out, but they only grew more unruly. Finally, resolved to take action against them, he at last looked around to make alliances with his own people, like the Anakoyi and other important chiefs of the Oyo country. But he never got far with that. The Jama learned about his plans and revolted. For the massive lowly Oyo persons in the Jama, Afanja's plan represented a serious threat that they would be surrendered again to the religious persecutions from which they had fled to Aloran. For the foreign born, most of whom had been slaves before, Afanja's plans threatened a return to slavery. A huge number of the Jama, particularly of the foreign born, armed with bows, arrows, spears, and swords, besieged Afanja's compound. He and the few men who were with him when the mob arrived were totally surprised and massively outnumbered by their assailants. In his extremity, Afonja called on Salagburu for help. By his arrogance during the time of his military victories, however, he had alienated Salagburu. But Salagburu's attitude was mostly influenced by his religious faith. For him, a Muslim chief, choosing to fight for an unbeliever, even though a friend, against a mass of co-religionists was a hard decision. Salagburu hesitated and hesitated and never took a decision. Still, Afonja fought like the Kakan foe that he was. After his compound was set on fire, he took the fight to the streets, and kept hacking down surge after surge of his adversaries until his noble body was shot through by countless arrows and spears. That was about early 1824. With the death of Afonja, Alimi, surrounded by the mass of the Jama, became the leader and commander of the faithful and therefore the strongest man in Aloran. According to Aloran traditions, Alimi was often heard to say that the clash between Afonja and the Jama had been caused by an unfortunate misunderstanding. Being a Yoruba man and a Muslim, Salik Baru thought that he would have the support of Alimi to become the ruler of the town. Only slowly did it become clear to him that the alien family of Alimi and his sons had taken over Aloran, with the support of all the Hausa and Fulani Jama and the overwhelming majority of the Oyo Muslim refugees. Effectively, Salik Baru's support did not extend much beyond his Oksuna quarter. Most people in the Oyo homeland had shown no interest in the growing problems between Afonja and his Jama forces. Many saw it as a trouble that he had brought upon himself, and most believed that he was more than strong enough to resolve it in some manner that would be to his benefit. When therefore he had tried, in his last days, to make alliances with some of the prominent people of his country, they had been mostly slow or hesitant to respond. But when the news of his death at the hands of the Jama came, it shocked the country profoundly. A resolve widely developed to drive the foreigners out of Aloran, disband the Jama and punish its ringleaders. A national army hurriedly formed for the purpose. Toyge, the Bale of Ogbomoso, who had commanded the right wing of the late Kakonfo's forces, was promoted as Kakonfo and put in command. An Aloran army, made up of Alamus Jama of all ethnicities, and Salik Burris followers, marched out. The two armies met at a place called Ogil. Toyge's cavalry was much smaller than the combined Aloran cavalry. A sanguinary battle ensued. The cavalry decided the day. As Toyge's army broke and fled, the Aloran cavalry pressed hard after them. In town after town they rallied and put up a stand, but they never managed to mobilize enough strength to check the Aloran cavalry. Therefore, many towns in the Imbolo province were destroyed and deserted. The human suffering in such places was horrendous. An endless stream of persons, who had snatched some belongings and fled, jammed the roads leading to the south. The old and infirm, and in many cases, children, were abandoned and left to perish. In the few Ibolo towns that survived, like Hoffa, Aaron, Igbona, Ilamona, 
as well as in towns to their immediate south, large refugee populations appeared. Quickly taken off the streets by the lineage compounds of these towns, they became heavy material burdens on the residents. Outside the immediate area affected by the Ogil battle, in the central and western provinces of the Oyo country, the news of the battle and its aftermath frightened many people into packing and heading south. Some towns and villages in the Oyo country were becoming empty. In spite of all these disasters, the Oyo people were far from ready to leave Alaran in the hands of foreigners. Alimi died, and his older son Abdul Salami assumed the title of Emir of Alaran and that, to most Oyo people outside the Loran, was an outrage. Preparations were therefore set in motion for another attack on the foreign rulers of Aloran. This time, a large army marched forward and besieged Aloran. An alliance was also made with the Noop ruler, Magia II, who came at the head of a new army to support the Oyo army. But this campaign turned out to be a very difficult one. Most of the towns around Aloran for miles had been destroyed in the previous campaign, and therefore there were no farms to supply food to the army. Starvation became a common experience of both the invaders and defenders of Aloran. It was the season of the ripening of the pods of the Arugba, locust bean, tree, and the army sent men to go fetching them from the country around from which the campaign became known as the Mugba Mugba War, the war in which soldiers lived on locust beans. The new army gave up and left. And, once again, it was the Aloran cavalry that ultimately decided the outcome of this war. The old Oyo superiority in cavalry had completely disappeared or, more correctly, the Oyo people of Aloran and their foreign compatriots have completely inherited the former Oyo supremacy in cavalry. After this, it became increasingly difficult for Oyo leaders to make concerted attempts to free Aloran. In fact, the failures in the wars against Aloran slowly bred despondency, part of the result of which was that some of the leading chiefs began to quarrel, or even fight, amongst themselves. There had, for years, been no generally accepted overlord over the Oyo people, and each Oba managed his own affairs as an independent ruler. This, in fact, was the fundamental reason for the failure of the attempts to drive the foreigners out of Aloran. The campaigns were poorly coordinated. The Ilafan still reigned in Oyoila, but he was no longer relevant to the affairs of most parts of the Oyo country. In the midst of this fragmentation and confusion, in fact, a strange short war occurred a war in which the Anakoyi was opposed by most of the other chiefs and Akoyi was besieged by a combined army, including, most surprisingly, an Aloran army commanded by Salad Baru. In Aloran, the result of this state of affairs in the Oyo country was that the hold of Alamis family on Aloran became tighter and more confident under the Emir Abdul Salami, the older of Alamis' two sons. About one year after Afanja's death, Salik Baru and the Emir Abdul Salami fell out, and a civil war ensued in Aloran. Though generally respected in the town, Salik Baru had no real contact with the mass of the Jama'a, and his solid support was limited to his Oksuna quarter. In the conflict that ensued, therefore, his Oksuna, supported by only a small part of the Jama'a, was quickly overwhelmed and he died fighting at the head of his men. With the death of Salik Baru vanished any immediate hope that an Oyo citizen of Aloran would rule the city. Aloran became an Islamic emirate, ruled by Alamis descendants as a royal family a royal family which then sought links with the Islamic Jihad movement going on beyond the Niger. And all that was due, ultimately, to Afonja. Alimi and his sons had Afonja to thank for bringing them to Aloran and for creating an army for them. Though Afonja never converted to Islam, the creation of an Islamic emirate in Aloran was essentially the work of his hands. All the evidence indicates quite strongly that the Oyo people of Aloran, constituting much more than 90% of the town's population, did not understand, or even give any thought to, the political implication of an emirate over their town or to the links which the emirs then forged beyond Yorubaland. To them, this would seem to have represented no more than the victory of their Islamic religion and the emir was seen almost entirely as a commander of the faithful. All the evidence would seem to show that, politically, their attention was focused entirely on the threats of the rest of the Oyo country against Iloran and, as will be seen in subsequent chapters, on the place of Iloran in the evolving political picture of Yorubaland. As long as Iloran was in danger from the rest of the Oyo country, and as long as the Oyo people of Aloran were consumed by their anxieties and desires about the place of Aloran and the rivalries among the new states of Yorubaland, of which Aloran became one of the strongest, questions about the legitimacy of an emirate, of Alimi and his sons as rulers over that emirate, and of the emir's extra Yoruba connections, could only seem like distractions and that was to be so throughout the 19th century. In short, to the Yoruba people of Aloran, Aloran was, politically, simply one of the Yoruba states absorbed in the epochal struggle among states of Yorubaland, no other goings-on of a political nature concerning their town were significant enough to attract their serious attention at all.
the Alimi family's links with Sokoto beyond the Niger appear to have been seen by the Yoruba of Aloran as, essentially, no more than a private family matter, and it never seems to have affected the life of their town in any significant measure. Compared with the emirates created by the Fulani jihadists in Hausa land beyond the Niger, Aloran was far from being a typical Fulani emirate. It is nearer the truth to call it a Yoruba Islamic emirate. In 1826, about two years after Afanja's death, the English explorer Clapperton and his team traveled through parts of the Oyo Empire and visited Oyo Ila. The Ilafan Majata granted the Mudians, especially because he thought that they had means of helping his country re establish unity and peace. In spite of all the disasters that it had gone through, the country and its capital city still impressed the Clapperton team as a considerably well ordered state. In the Igbado province, they saw some destruction of one or two towns caused by local conflicts. And then, not far from Oyoila, they saw some villages destroyed by Jamar Rampages. For the rest, the country was still, in their view, in good shape. Clapperton's assistant, Richard Lander, was of the opinion that the Ilafan's kingdom was a beautiful one in many respects, and that all the Ilafan needed were a few big guns, cannons, with which to drive out the troublers of his country and restore order. Lander, accompanied by his brother John, revisited Oyoila in 1830 and again had some interviews with the Ilafan Majatu. The country was in worse condition than it had been in 1826, and the Alafan appeared weaker and more helpless. Still, in Lander's opinion, Majota's kingdom was not beyond being restored to order and strength. According to Oyo traditions, after the first visit of the white men, Majota made a strong attempt to knit the Oyo homeland, the heart of the empire, together again. He is said to have personally made a plea to the leading chieftains of the country, urging a revival of the unity and power of the empire, under the leadership of the Alafan. So successful was he that all the leading chieftains assembled at Ikoi for a conference, with the Anakoyi as host. The conference started on a strong note of hope, as everybody present seemed agreed on a return to a general allegiance to the Alafan and a revival of the kingdom. But, as the meeting progressed, the influence of suspicion became unconquerable. In particular, the assembled provincial notables saw how abjectly depressed the status of the chiefs of the Oyo Masi had become in the affairs of the city of Oyoila and feared that that was the type of fate the Alafan desired for them too in the affairs of the empire. With that, no decision could be taken to rally round the Alafan. The fate of the kingdom and its empire was sealed. In summary, then, the last years of Majota's reign were terrible years for the empire and for the Oyo homeland. It was Majota's misfortune to sit on the throne of an empire whose vassal provinces were breaking away while its core kingdom was also breaking up. After years of increasing restiveness, Dahomey, under Gezo, revolted and was lost to the empire in 1823. The year after that, the Jamaa revolt and Afanja's death turned the Loran into a potent center of rebellion, and of aggression against the rest of the country. After a series of shakily united actions to free Aloran, the various local rulers in the Oyo homeland did not only go their separate ways, they actually fell into squabbling and fighting with one another and as the 1820s drew to a close, the internal conflicts intensified. One such conflict resulted in the destruction of Ikoi. The general disintegration of the Alafan's power had gradually led to the loosening of Oyo's control in Igbado. When Clapperton and his exploration team traveled through Igbado in December 1825, there were already signs of local weakening of Oyo's control there, evidenced by the fresh ruins of at least one town recently attacked by another town. By about 1830, Igbado was at last lost to the empire, as various Igbado communities went on and found their own way. The disintegration of Oyo rule became so complete, for instance, that even one Lalari, named Akun, who had represented the Alafan at Hayana, renounced his allegiance to Oyo and set himself up as an independent ruler at a town called Rifurfu. Then came a two-year drought and famine, followed by an epidemic of a respiratory disease. Most families lost members to that epidemic. The aged Alafan Majatu himself succumbed to it in 1831. Majatu was succeeded by Amato, who reigned for only about two years. In the last years of Majotus' reign, Aloran had sent armies to attack towns in the area of Oyoila, but they had not had the courage to attack Oyoila directly. Probably in the brief interregnum before the Ilafan Amato was crowned, a small Aloran army came and entered the capital city and sacked some streets of it, taking away some booty from the city and parts of the palace. Following upon this, the rulers and people of Aloran more or less regarded their town as the central city of the Oyo country, just as Afonja had desired, and Oyoila as a tributary of Aloran. The new Alafan Amato was absolutely unprepared to reconcile himself to being regarded as a vassal of Aloran, and was perpetually consumed by the search for a way to reverse the situation, even though his position as the Alafan continued to weaken markedly almost by the day. 
tributes had ceased to come from any part of the Oyo country. Even worse, many of the Oyo chieftains had become allies, secretly or openly, of Aloran, through the influence of their relations and friends who had become prominent citizens of Aloran. Operating from such a position of strength, the leadership of Aloran had considerable success in encouraging disunity among the chieftains of the Oyo country, and in inducing them to fight petty wars against one another, wars in which Aloran's army supported this or that chieftain, resulting in the destruction of some of their strong cities. Even then, the Alaf and Namato never gave up the struggle to put together a coalition of Oyo chieftains to rid the country of the Aloran Emirate. Unlike his predecessor Majatu, Amato was totally unprepared to live with the thorn of Iloran's rebellious population and foreign ruling family in his country's foot. In 1832, his striving bore some fruit. At his urging, a coalition of Oyo chieftains raised a fairly large army, and the Alafin sent it against Iloran. But this army had very little chance of succeeding. Its commanders were too badly divided by suspicion and intrigues. Outside Iloran, at the small village of Kanla, the Alafin's army and the Iloran army met. A hard battle followed but the Aloran forces again won the day. Broken-hearted, Amato returned to Oyoila, resolved to continue the fight. As he saw it, that was his destiny, as descendant of the great Alafans, he could not accept the loss of Aloran to what he regarded as a rebellious mob and a threat to all order. Unfortunately, a short time after the Kanla War, a huge fire raised parts of the palace and destroyed much of its treasures. Amato did not survive that for long. In 1833, he died quietly in his palace. Amato's successor, Ayuiwu, a tall, handsome prince, ascended the throne with a clear mission to take Aloran back and then revive his empire. By his time, the rulers of Aloran had become more confident of their power and more demanding of tributes and other signs of their power in the country. Soon after Ayuiwu ascended the throne, therefore, the emir, then Shida, brother of Abdul Salami, invited him to Aloran. Though the Alafin was, on the whole, respectfully treated by the people and rulers of Aloran, he could only feel the humiliation of being made to go there by the emir. Moreover, as the Alafin was leaving Iloran, Shida ordered the seizure of one of the royal Gbedu drums from the Alafin's attendants apparently hoping that its possession would increase his legitimacy before the Oyo citizens of Iloran. Aliwiwu felt deeply insulted, and decided that it was time for him to fight. Consequently, when Shida invited him again to Iloran, so that he might ceremonially accept conversion to Islam, he refused to go. The emir responded by sending an army to ravage the suburbs of Oyoila and to threaten Oyoila itself. At the invitation of friends among the Aloran chiefs, some Oyo chieftains went to the assistance of the Aloran forces. Aluiwu got ready to fight and invited the Bariba to help him. A Bariba army came to Oyoila. The Aloran army, assisted by some of the Oyo chieftains, was driven back from the gate of the capital city as well as from nearby villages. The Bariba archers dislodged the Aloran army besieging the small town of Gboto and many in the Aloran cavalry, while fleeing from the town, drowned in the flooded streams of the rainy season. Thus assured of Bariba help, the Alafin issued a general proclamation urging his country to rally round him for a final attack on Aloran. Most Oyo towns were by then friends or allies of Aloran. The Alafin therefore decided to make a detour, with his Bariba allies, through some of these towns in order to give them courage to rise up and fight with him. The large army that resulted then marched towards Aloran. Frightened by these developments, the emir gathered a much larger army than ever before, even recruiting troops from the Noop country on the Niger. When the two armies met, the Aloran army was very much larger and immediately tried to overwhelm the Alafan's army with its superior numbers. The Alafan's army fought back bravely and routed the Aloran army, inflicting heavy casualties on them. That victory did not prove decisive, however, as the Aloran cavalry managed to counterattack and salvage the situation. Still the Alafin had good reason to claim victory for the day and to have high hopes of ultimate victory. As the Alafin and his Bariba allies, thus elated, got ready for the final onslaught on Aloran, some more leaders and towns of the Oyo country also arrived to join the Alafin's forces. At sunrise, a confident Alafin advanced on Aloran. Aloran had never been attacked by an army of such magnitude, and fear and consternation gripped the city. On this second day, however, the hidden weaknesses in the Alafin's army surfaced. Many of the Oyo chiefs in the Alafin's army were not completely loyal to his cause. Among the chiefs, suspicions and fears about the Alafin's intentions were rife largely because the Alafin's would not give up attempts to suppress the Oyo Ila chiefs. For instance, it was known by all that when Aluiwa's Bariba allies had arrived in Oyo Ila for the current war, Aluiwa had first employed them against a Basaran whom he had regarded as too outspoken. Sent by the Alafin, 
some of the Bariba troops had besieged that Basarun's compound, forcing him to commit suicide. The Oyo chiefs could not but wonder what the Alafan would use his Bariba allies to do after Aloran had been subdued. Would he unleash them on the leading rulers of the Oyo country? Rather than being grateful to the Alafan's Bariba allies, therefore, the Oyo chieftains treated them spitefully, and privately ridiculed them as crude barbarians. Not only were some of the chiefs secret friends of the rulers of Aloran, many who had relatives that had fled as Muslims to Aloran and had become notable persons there were not sure that they wanted Aloran and its inhabitants devastated. Wars between Aloran and any Oyo forces were wars of Oyo people against Oyo people, and the Oyo of Aloran, reinforced by large numbers of foreign-born co-religionists, were more united in purpose and derived much fervor from their Islamic faith and their memory of religious persecution. In this circumstance, the Alafan could only be victorious by decisively winning a straight short encounter. When the final fighting spilled over to a second day, the hidden fishers and his forces had time to manifest and exert destructive impact. Quite early in the second day, therefore, elements of the Aloran cavalry broke through a shaky wing of the Alafan's army and attacked from the rear. In the vicious fighting that followed, large numbers fell on both sides. The Bariba king commanding the Bariba troops fell, fighting furiously till the end. At the height of the fighting, Aluiwa's oldest son galloped up to his royal father, saluted him goodbye, and plunged back into the thick of the battle. Both father and son, fighting as true princes, perished that day. Some traditions have it that the Alafan Aluiwu, wounded almost to the point of death, was picked up on the battlefield and taken alive into a Loran where, still proudly refusing to acknowledge the emir as ruler, he was executed. The once great empire of the once mighty Alafans, still fighting on the offensive till the very end, went, at last, to its grave. The city of Oyoila did not survive the terrible news. For more than two hundred years, it had been the abode of surpassing power and glory. It would not wait to endure abject subjugation. For years, some citizens had been leaving and heading towards the south. As soon as the news of the battle and the fate of the Alafan came, the remaining residents began to pack their things. This was no panic flight, or flight under pressure. Families calmly packed their belongings and set out, many coming back repeatedly for more of their things. Most went south, some found their way to towns still standing in the Oyo country, some went to the Bariba country to the west, and some even went to relations living in Aloran. Slowly, over many days, the lineage compounds, the palace, the marketplaces, the streets, all emptied as the light went out on the once proud, but now dead, city of the Elafans. 